So, uh, you know, it's very intimidating being back here at Loyola Marymount, especially uh, knowing that there's so many deans <laughs> in the room, and of course my uh, ex-professor, Dr. Kiesner, who, who really I took, I think it's two courses that you ended up teaching in entrepreneurship, or at least with, <laughs> Very close, very close. Well, it's true that uh, uh, I have graduated from Loyola Marymount, and I had an amazing time here. Uh, and back when I was a freshman, though, computers were very different than what you're used to today. <laughs> computers literally would take up, the, the computer room was as big as this room. And the way you worked with a computer were with things like punch cards and things yeah. like that. And you literally could work with basically a single character at a time. So they were also extremely slow. A single uh, portable computer like you're on your phone today is many times more powerful than a mainframe that filled up this whole room. And back in those days, you literally would be in a situation where you would be desperate for computer time because when everybody else was on the computer, it was really slow. So I used to climb up the gutter of Pereira Hall to get to the second floor where the computer terminals were to break in the program all night long because it was instantaneous reaction from the computer because I was the only person on the computer. That was a long time ago, and of course, of many technology generations ago. But before I get started, let me ask a few of you here. How many of you think technology or the world today is better off than it was, say, 10 years ago. So many of you think that technology is, is really, uh, the world is a better place than it was. And, you know, if you think about what we hear, what the media says, it always confounds me. I don't know if it confounds you, but it confounds me because the way you hear people describing today's events, it sounds like it's pretty catastrophic, right? It sounds like the world is coming to an end. Yeah. So if the world is better off than it was 10 years ago, why, why is it such a negative vibe? Why are we talking about so many challenges, so many difficulties? And so I thought today uh, I would talk a little bit about my background. But before I get into the speech, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've been a very blessed young man. Well, I'm not so young anymore. <laughs> But I lived a very blessed childhood. When I was uh, a young boy, my father, who passed away two weeks ago, he got me the opportunity to start playing at a school in L.A. called Caltech. And I was just a young boy. And uh, he would have Dick Feynman and Linus Pauling and Murray Galland, and we these are Nobel Prize winners in chemistry and physics, would come over to the house regularly. And he offered me a chance to, to be exposed to many things. And I bring that up because as you all go through your life, make sure you give people the chance to be exposed to different ways of thinking, different ideas, different technologies, because you never know what will ignite that imagination, what will ignite that person to do something so special that will change the way the world works. So from nine years old, there was no way I was going to compete with my dad. He went to Caltech and MIT, full scholarships. He came over from Greece after World War II. Uh, the family had lost everything, of course. And uh, uh, basically, he was a rocket scientist. He designed rocket engines, had his own company for 35 years, and he would let me get a chance to hear him present and talk about his technology and his innovations in rocketry when I was a young boy, and I got to see that all of my life, and I'm just very grateful that my kids are here, so pay attention, kids. <laughs> I'm being graded by my old professor over here. <laughs> and uh, really, uh, I hope that uh, some of the topics I'm going to share might be interesting to you. And I think the first is that fact that I had this chance to really get exposed to technology and science and the way it works at a very young age. And I was able to start my own software company. Well, actually, right when I left Loyola, I didn't start my own company. My dad said to me, Jim, you need to go out there and get some real work experience. I said, okay. But I was very fortunate. I was the 10th employee of a little startup company. And I got to design all of HealthNet, which is a big HMO's computer systems, at the age of 23. 
I didn't even know what an HMO was. So the controller of the company sat next to me, described his business, and I would design the software all night long and show him what I had done in the new morning. He said, that's pretty good. But I said, I can't do all the functions at that time of a $400 million company by myself. We need to hire some people. He goes, well, what do you want? So we hired and hired, and, and, and by the end of three years, I had 65 people working for me which was about 80% of the company that I had been hired by. So I went to the owners of that company and said, excuse me, you know, most of the company works for me. Do you mind if I get a piece of equity in the business? And they said, thanks for asking. No. <laughs> so I decided to quit and uh, go work at a company that was just down the hill here uh, at, uh, for a division of uh, American Medical International called PHS. It designed all the computer systems for hospitals, how to run a hospital. So I learned the insurance side of the business and I was now working for a software company and was designing hospitals. It was a great job because now I'm, what, about 25? And the job was I got to fly to all the hospitals they had in the country and design how to integrate all their computer systems. You probably heard something that's pretty much ancient history. It's called medical errors. Well, the data errors were a function of every time you went to a different computer system, you had to provide your data. You'd have to get Jim Dimitriatis, but they'd spell it D I M I. And the next computer system would be spelled D E M E. So when they tried to integrate the information, it was impossible because it was two different people as far as the computer systems were concerned. So, so we proposed the creation of something called HL7, which is a way to integrate all the computer systems in hospitals. And I went to my boss, I said, look, you know, I'm on a committee, I'm one of the founders of this, it's a great idea, I think you should build a product that integrates all these computer systems very quickly. We can use software to make this a very consistent process. And my boss looked at me and goes, you know, that's a great idea. He, was, in fact, was a professor, John Quinn, here at Loyola Marymount. And, uh, and so he went to the board. He goes, let me t ask the board. He went to the board and proposed that we build this product. He came back to me the, after the board meeting. He goes, you know, they said no. I go, what? It's a great idea. I mean, we could really build something that nobody has in the world. And it would really save millions and millions of dollars. And so he basically said, well, nothing I can do. So I quit. And went and started my own company. That company, within four years, was bigger than the company I quit. And we integrated, it's called CBOM, took it public. I was very uh, uh, fortunate. I started the company with $5,000, no venture capital, grew the company naturally and organically. I did pay myself nothing for a few years and lived off credit cards. And, uh, but was able to grow the business into about a $190 million a year company. Uh, and uh, took it public, but when I realized Silicon Valley had learned what I was doing, um, I decided to really expand beyond healthcare. So I got some pretty interesting people to join my board. I had the president of Oracle, the CEO and founder of Accenture, the president of PeopleSoft, the managing partner of Ernst & Young, and the head of global business development for EDS, um, some of the biggest companies in the world were on my board by the time I was 34. Took the company public, was one of only three companies that was able to go public during the dot-com crash of 2001, and basically traveled the world uh, integrating the world's largest businesses. Expand, had expanded obviously beyond healthcare. Gartner Group, which is a technology group that ranks technology, ranked us the world's leading visionaries when it came to inventing technologies. We invented a variety of technologies, distributed architectures. Uh, we even had uh, what we call cloud-based architecture. We called it composite applications back then. And I presented it to Larry Ellison, who, of course, is currently still chairman of Oracle. And he says, ah, I think the database is important. The cloud is not important. <laughs> he spent a lot of billions to catch up. But he can't. So it's been a great life. I quit uh, that business. When one day I was looking at my wife and she was holding our brand new twins and our third daughter had just arrived and I was driving off and they were all waving goodbye to me. They were all like one and two years old and I go, you know something? I said, hold the car. I go, Hanny, come over here. She goes, what's up? They go, I'm going to sell the company. She goes, why? I go, you know something? I don't want to miss this part of our children's lives. So I sold the company for about $400 million dollars. 
and uh, decided to retire. And that was in 2005. Then I decided, you know what, I'm Greek. I got to do what Greeks do. I'm going to go do some restaurants and hotels. <laughs> you know we like food. It just seems to be a cultural thing. So did that, built a couple of hotels. Uh, and at the same time in 2005, we created at Caltech the Demetrios Prizes. Because that's where it all started, right? That's where I first got to play with computers when I was a little boy. My dad would drop me off at the computer science department at the computer room for the whole day. And he would come pick me up at 5 o'clock after he'd been visiting all of his scientist friends. And he would ask me how my day went. I'd ask him how his day went. And, uh, you know, today, if you leave your kid for an entire day in a computer science room, you'd probably go to jail. <laughs> so it's a different world. But what he would do is he would tell me a little bit about the science work, and he said something very prophetic. This is now in 75, when I'm 13 years old. He says, Jim, if you ever get a chance, you've got to help these scientists start companies. They have so many amazing ideas, but they have no interest in business. And their ideas could really make and change the world. So... Fast forward back now to 2005, we create the Demetrius Prize at Caltech. We give cash prizes to the top PhD students at Caltech, arguably the greatest science institution in the world. What people don't realize is Caltech has one-tenth the student body of Stanford or MIT. One-tenth. 2,000. Okay? Graduate and undergraduate. Yet it produces almost the same number of patents as MIT or Stanford shows you the brain power that we have here in Los Angeles at Caltech. And we give out these cash prizes, and something very odd was happening. At the award ceremony, I would see that all of these graduate students, we'd give out the awards, and I'd go, so where are you going? What are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to go work for Google. I'm going to go work for Apple. I'm going to go work for Microsoft. I'm going to work at Oracle or Facebook. And I'd go, well, what about your thesis? I mean, it was a brilliant thesis. We're giving you cash prizes because your thesis was amazing. You know, it's so hard to raise money. It's just not something I, I think I can do. And so I did some research in this area. And it turns out that we have decreased funding, especially over the last uh, administration prior to Trump. We decreased funding scientific research in the United States by 25%. Did anybody hear that? I didn't. 25% reduction of funding of scientific research at our universities. Pretty shocking. Because if you're like me, you probably agree and think that science can have a big positive impact on the trajectory of all of us. Our families, our children, our children's children. And so I got very upset about this and disturbed and I went to the provost at Caltech and the president and all the people that I was involved with, and I said, is this true? And they go, well, yes, it is. So I go, are you concerned about it? They said, well, no, not too much, because, you know, we're Caltech, and we typically do a little bit better than everybody else when it comes to raising money. Great Recession hits, 08, 09. Suddenly, 2014, we're giving up the cash prizes, and I say in my usual speech, you know, I wish you kids would stick around here and get your start companies, and you know, funding is, is, I know, challenging, but uh, we can find a way. And the, the head of the School of Science and Engineering stands up and goes, Jim, you know, you've been telling us this for six years. I want you to know that we have done the math and that it is impossible for us to keep up with funding based off of the cuts that we have now seen for six years straight. And I said, well, that's getting serious. He goes, well, you said you had an idea to fix that. Do you? And I said, absolutely. I've had a lot of years to think about it. <laughs> Six years. And so uh, I said, look, there's only one solution. Governments are not going to fix our problems because our government can't fix itself. <laughs> right? How are they going to fix the problem that they can't work together? So what we have to do is we have to come up with a new strategy. We have to come up with a new way to fund scientific research. And he goes, well, what is it? I go, it's very simple. It's private capital. We have to figure out a new method 
to fund scientific research. And in return, we have to commercialize that scientific research at a rate that has never been done before. So this is the first time I'm talking about what I do publicly to an audience. That was an idea I had in 2014. And in 15, I raised $50 million to fund research at Caltech. Hired, I was the biggest investor, and uh, I basically hired a couple of people, and I do a completely different approach to venture capital than has ever been done. And what we do is we are looking for the world's top scientists and ideas that can be commercialized. What that means is we take ideas that are brilliant science, that have patents and strong IP protection, and we make companies out of those concepts. And what started at one university a couple of years ago has now grown to 16, and next year will be at 32. And to show you the scale, at one university we started 24 investments in a single year. Last year, over the last 18 months, by December's our window, we will have done eight investments, and next year we expect to do 250. Nobody in the world has ever done that, right? Nobody has ever started 250 investments in a single 12 to 18 month period of time. But what I'm going to show you is why we did that and what's coming. It is the singularly most rewarding and exciting thing I've done. Some could argue I've seen a couple of good things and had a couple of good opportunities come my way. But what's about to happen is mind-blowing. Absolutely remarkable. But before I go into the scientific detail of what's coming, and I can speak now because we have access to the research at the nation's top universities, I'll tell you a little bit about why it's so important. Mm -hmm. You know, it starts with disasters. And I mentioned this at the beginning. It's a little disconcerting, right, when you pick up the newspaper and say, oh my gosh, you know, poor people here, and minorities there, and uh, the environment over here. When, in fact, see, things seem to be a little different. You know, we talk about drought. It's a real issue, right? Especially in California. We haven't built a new infrastructure to uh, store additional water since the 80s, right? And our population has doubled. Something we should pay a lot of attention to. We talk about famine. A real issue still across the world. Why are there hungry people? We talk about crops, GMO. Insecticide, insect resistance. Do you know that in Africa, about 60% of the subsistence farmers, which are farmers that are growing food for themselves, 60% of the crops are lost to insects. It's an incredible statistic. Think of that. 60%. And we talk about resistance to insecticide. We talk about altering our food, yet we still seem to be ignoring the fact that when I was a kid, there was nobody that had peanut allergies. There was nobody that had celiac or IBD. These were unheard of. Every kid brought peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to school. If you do that at a public school today, you get kicked out. They said, go home, come back when you don't have your peanut butter. <laughs> what? Why? I just have a peanut butter sandwich because people are extremely allergic. Now, why are they allergic today, but they weren't allergic 30 years ago? Interesting. Power, pollution. Without energy, without electricity, it would be a very different life. So we must provide power and Preferably clean power. There's no questions that the hundreds of millions of tons that we're dumping into the atmosphere is a lot of carbon. What is it doing? Well, we're not sure, but we know what it could do. 
and what it seems to be doing. But you know, weather of course has changed. What people, many people don't know, I don't know if you've read the book Cadillac Desert. It's a book about the history of water in the western United States. Amazing book. There are droughts in California that have lasted a thousand years. A thousand year drought, imagine. Disease. Obviously, you know, with Ebola, other diseases, this is a scary thing. Diseases that we can't treat or cure. Natural disasters, earthquakes, been happening long before humans had written history. Riots, of course people are upset. My biggest concern is for the middle class. If we only have limited resources and the government is running trillion dollar a year deficits, when do the resources run out, and who pays that price? How are we going to take care of the millions and millions of people, and what are they going to do if they don't have food or water or clean opportunities to live a good life and improve their life? Drugs. Are you familiar with all the addiction challenges? Right? Tens of thousands of people dying a year at young ages from all classes of life because they get addicted to painkillers. Destruction, whether it's war, in this case another earthquake photo. Terrorism. Some of you probably weren't born when this happened. I remember perfectly where I was. And it changed the world. It changed the world forever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Deformity. You look at the ear. A beautiful baby, but why is there a genetic defect here? And what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. So you start taking this, all this, and you start really thinking about how messed up the world is. It all leads to one thing. But does it really lead to a world of catastrophe, a world of disaster, a world we can't control and improve upon? I don't think so. Why? What I've learned as I've traveled the world is that it's not what people tell you, it's what you believe. You believe you can make the world a better place? If you believe that, you can. Yeah. I believe it. And that's what I try to do every day. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing here is we're taking an amalgamation of human attributes and putting them together to really try to make the world a better place. Things like intelligence. So let's take intelligence our brightest, and let's learn from them. How about wisdom? Wisdom is an incredible attribute, right? It's not just about how smart you are. It's very interesting, right? I get to meet many of the most brilliant scientists on the planet. Their intelligence is amazing, but they need wisdom, too, to bring that intelligence to something productive. Knowledge, our understanding of knowledge, our need to understand and have hope, right? Humans are very unique in this ability that we can have hope. We have science. We have the ability to take our knowledge of science and our environment and make solutions. And we have a spirit. We want to do good. I believe inherently that people are good and that they do want to do good. Sure, not everybody but I think the majority of us. So if you start putting this together, let me give you some interesting statistics. This is from the Wall Street Journal. came out earlier this year. Annual homicide rates, down 70%. Poverty levels, down 70 80%. Pollution, look at how much more we used to admit versus what we admit today. 
nuclear weapons, oil spills, war, the death rates are down by 66%. But is this how you feel? I mean, does it feel like it's made that much progress? It does to me because I'm, I'm a lot older than all of you. I think there's a few of us that might remember all these. People live in extreme poverty, deaths due to terrorism, unemployment in minorities. It's a good statistic here. In the Hispanic population, a great statistic as well. So we seem to be making progress. How about this? The average number of fatalities due to natural disasters is down 80%. We all know this, right? In the 1800s, the average life expectancy was 30 years. Now it's 81 years. And I'm going to show you some reasons why it's going to grow much, much higher, much, much faster. Disease was decimated, of course, by what? Vaccines, sanitation, antibiotics, famine, crop rotation, synthesizers. Poverty was slashed. Trade, cheaper food, cheaper clothing, violent crime, <coughs> reduced by the rule of law, safety regulations, tamping down pollution, oppression, and discrimination absolutely exists. But because of the technology that we have, the internet, we can report it and do something about it faster than ever before. War, I think, is being marginalized. It's not popular because we can see how ugly it is. So let's talk about what humans have done and are about to do that are going to fundamentally change this. As I mentioned, I get to see all sorts of interesting technology. This is a, the world's first mass-viewed plastic heart valve. What you're seeing is a plastic heart valve, and it'll be, uh, it's under review by the FDA as we speak. We expect it to be installed in humans in the next quarter, sometime in January, February, March. Multiple institutions have signed up for this. Today, if you need a heart valve replaced, it's by animal tissue. It's either pig skin or cow skin. They're hand-stitched, handmade. The average cost of a single heart valve is $1,500. They last between 10 and 15 years, typically. They calcify, they need to be removed, or your calcium breaks and you get a stroke. You need to take blood thinners the rest of your life. This costs $20. It will last your entire lifetime. It doesn't calcify. And it works for three different types of valves. It works for your aortic heart valve, which is what all existing heart valve replacements are. It also works for the first time for a mitral heart valve. It's the first true mitral heart valve replacement. There are none available today. And the third one is it's a TAVI valve, where it's a transcatheter, and they cut your femoral artery and insert it up through your artery into your heart so you don't have to crack the chest. This will be worth probably north of a billion dollars, this company. It's made a plastic valve that's inexpensive. You dip it, it's all manufacturing, it's robotic, and the manufacturing space is double the size of the stage. It will replace two 500,000 square foot manufacturing facilities. And it will bring heart valves to the masses because it costs nothing. You saw that child with a deformed ear. So what happens is uh, genetic deformities like that, uh, in this particular case, that disease or that genetic deformity is a function of a ear which um, has a deformed cartilage. So this is a 3D printing company that we funded which is able to print cartilage, but it's important to, to note that it's the first company that identified that there are two types of cartilage. There's a cartilage, which is you're all familiar with, around your nose, but there's a special layer of cartilage, which is the cartilage that attaches to the bone. So for the first time, you'll be able to custom build 
any part of nose and ear that's made out of cartilage and get it to actually bind to the bone. Very, very exciting for all the people who have that. Now think about where this goes to. It's not just your ear or nose. It can be your spine. You have a bulging disc. It can be your knee. You need a cartilage replacing your knee. Okay? So many of these pieces are coming. And they can actually take your cartilage and clone it. So when we take a look at what we spend our gross national product on, what is the single largest industry in the United States now? Anybody? Healthcare. 20% of our gross national product is spent in healthcare. And if we can reduce that cost, wouldn't that be great? But what do we do? What do we do today? We typically have a pill that you have to take for the rest of your life. We are seeing technologies that will eradicate disease and eliminate it completely. You will take a pill, maybe get a few shots, and you'll never take anything again. It's gone. This is a company out of uh, New York, one of our portfolio companies. What they've done, oops, So, let me see if I can get back here. No. What I want to show you is Actinovac, is the name of this company. Let's see if we can get the video to go back. No, I can't. All right. So this is, I'll talk about this one briefly. This is for kidney stones. So the way we treat kidney stones today are two processes. There's laser lithotripsy or where they stick a, ur a laser beam up your ureter and they nuke effectively the kidney stone with the laser. You have to be sedated, you have to go into an operating room, surgical procedure, very expensive of course, anesthesiologists. What we've done is we've invented a new bubble that attaches to the kidney stone and you bombard it with sonic waves and the kidney stone breaks up like death charges are attacked again. So these bubbles surround and attach to the kidney stone, and then the sonic wave starts to cause the, vi the vibration of these bubbles. You can see it here, and it breaks the kidney stone into lots of little pieces so you can pass it without any surgical procedure at all. It's an outpatient procedure, it takes 30 minutes. So you take what's an extremely $30,000, $50,000 expense, and now you drop it into something that costs a thousand or two thousand dollars. The one before that, the graphic, was a company that has taken a peptide which is emitted by a bacteria in our mouth and what this uh, dental biologist I found is that this peptide does one thing only. It kills white blood cells in your mouth that are activated that are trying to destroy the active microbiome in your mouth. So everybody, of course, we all have lots of bacteria in our mouth. Imagine what our mouths would smell like if we didn't have bacteria, right? That's what kills and eats and chews up all the little food bits. That microbiome is extremely important. So if you get a little bit of white blood cells, which come out of the gums naturally, etc., those white blood cells do what? They kill bacteria. So if this guy posited, was the thought that if we take this bacteria, and we take what it emits, it's like a harpoon into the heart of activated white blood cells, let's inject it in people that have diseases that are diseases where they have a activated white blood cell, where the body is attacking itself. It's called an autoimmune disorder. What are those? Leukemia, okay. IBD, Crohn's disease, arthritis, Psoriasis, all of these are diseases where the body is attacking itself. So they've injected this with in animal models, and in every single instance, it kills all the activated white blood cells that are genetic mutations. Those are not normal white blood cells, right? They are mutations. 
and it kills every single one in the body and every animal is cured 100% from every one of these diseases. If that works in humans, you're talking about no more chemotherapy for leukemia. It'll, you'll get a shot and it's gone. You're talking about psoriasis. Shot and gone. Very exciting. And that's what I think about when I think about healthcare. How to drop costs, right? How to change. Let's talk about another one of our key costs in the world that we live in. Without electricity, without energy, it would not be the world that we are used to. So one of our companies will be announcing this in January at the Consumer Electronics Show. We have a way of remotely charging electrical devices up to 30 feet away. So for those that are older like me, we remember when Wi-Fi first came, right? When Wi-Fi first came, before Wi-Fi came, you had to plug every computer into the wall. Then Wi-Fi came, and it was like, oh my gosh, what a miracle, Wi-Fi. I don't have to plug it into a wall. But it was a big thing, right? A big chip, and you'd plug it into the side of your computer, and you'd get Wi-Fi pretty slow back then, but better than plug it into a wall. This is a device that is smaller than my pinky, my pinky nail, and it has a phased array. It can beam energy to a receiving chip by the same guy who invented the pulse power system that's in every single cell phone on the planet. Back then, if you guys uh, remember some of us, that the, the original cell phones looked like briefcases. What happened was we were able to shrink that down, and one of the key elements of that shrinkage had to do with power consumption. You pulse power as a, in data communication. It's not a continuous stream of data. So we're able to now wirelessly beam energy to a receiving chip that is as big as a piece of grain, of a grain of rice. And we can beam it, and we can charge your phone while you're sitting at Starbucks. Pretty interesting. As I said, that will be announced at Consumer Electronics. Now, another use of this is drones. Imagine our soldiers in combat. Or imagine the police during a, a drug bust. A drone is flying up there watching what's going on. We can beam energy, not just 30 feet, which is what we do with something the size of a smoke detector, but if we build a big array that's, say, 6 feet wide, we can beam it 1,000 feet, which means we can beam it to a device that's up in the sky, and it will never have to come down. What are the implications of that? You're all business majors, right, some of you? Think about the business opportunities that this provides. <laughs> now, here's another thing. This is something that I found is at work at every single university. There are projects underway that are research universities for new generations of batteries. We've gotten to see everything that's being done at universities. Now, let me tell you something. There's a new generation of battery architectures where we slice the battery into multiple pieces using uh, some unique products. I won't go into it just yet. And what it does is it allows you to increase the storage of energy by 3x. So imagine a battery for a Tesla where you get 200 miles, now you're at 600 miles. Now you're competitive with a car. You have the same range and the cost is the same. So this technology is absolutely, it's not a new chemistry, it's actually a new design for batteries. So imagine the implications if all batteries could triple their storage capacity. Solar panels. So the average efficiency of a solar panel that you buy, an inexpensive one, is about 15 to 20 percent. We have a coating technology that came out of Jet Propulsion Labs, which micro etches at an atomic scale substrates, which are part of solar panels. You know, the structure you see inside that solar panel. We etch that, we can increase the power uh, efficiency by 
For $10, we can increase solar panels efficiency, say, from 20% to 25%. And we can retrofit that to every solar panel. That will make solar energy more efficient than the most efficient gas turbine made. Which means now we're at, what, an inflection point. When we see these types of changes where it's cheaper to do something like solar, which means no maintenance, basically, imagine replacing gas turbines with this type of technology. Now, the car gets a pretty bad rap these days, but there are hundreds of millions of cars around the world, and more importantly, hundreds of millions of two-stroke and four-stroke engines, right? Think of a leaf blower, think of a, uh, a lawnmower, okay? They're emitting a lot of carbon. Mm -hmm. So we found an interesting spark plug from another university that is a plasma spark plug. So instead of a single spark from the spark to the wall of an internal combustion engine in a cylinder, what this does is it creates a lightning, if you will, effect of sparks that go 180 degrees, actually, excuse me, 360 degrees, and what it does is it ignites all the fuel in a combustion chamber at once. No shock wave, extremely efficient. This one device reduces carbon emissions by 25, 20%, and that spark plug will reduce, therefore, or improve gas mileage by 20%, reduce carbon emissions by 20%. So you're talking about a fundamental shift in car efficiency that is massive when you can multiply that by millions and millions of cars. And it's retrofittable. So it's something that we think is, has a tremendous opportunity to just completely change the way we look at automobiles. Now, agriculture. You know, one of the things that always amazes me, right, is that we hear about overproduction of food, but why are there hungry people then? Right? Obviously, it's the logistics of moving food from one place to another. It's the type of food that we grow, where that food is. So one of the things that we're able to do, in fact, I don't know if you saw that here in L.A., there was a new Nobel Prize winner announced uh, last week, uh, Frances Arnold at Caltech. Her uh, 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 invention... Uh, is a, in the areas of uh, chemical engineering. And uh, she, for example, created the first silicon-based life form. Wonderful lady. She happens to be my first investment. And what she did is she created a way to create insect pheromones that are very inexpensive. We're talking about an order of magnitude less expensive than today's insect pheromone generation uh, generating technologies, the chemistry behind it. The way a pheromone works is moths, when they fly at night, right? Why don't moths fly during the day? Because they're blind. What they actually do is they spray a scent. And the antenna on a moth is used to identify where the mates are. So a molecule of a pheromone hits the, this antenna, then the moth will fly this way. If it hits it over here, it'll fly over this way. And that's how they find each other, right? You've always heard moths are blind. Well, yeah. So they get really, really close. And so the way they find each other is that smell. So what these brilliant scientists have done is they say, we've now created an inexpensive way to create the scent of any moth. We can spray it on a field, and what happens is the moths come out at night and they get very frustrated because they can't find a mate and they die naturally frustrated three days later. <laughs> I think we know a few college students. Are sure. <laughs> but seriously, you know, the, the, the moth situation is pretty darn interesting, right? The average, even if we use maximum GMO and insecticide, the best farm practices have 90% efficiency of food meaning you produce 90% of the food that you can produce, you still lose 10% to insects. This technology takes it down to 1%. You only lose 1% of the food a farm can produce. It's extremely inexpensive. Our manufacturing costs are $10 an acre per growing season. Costs nothing. 
We've already done trials at 50 different, uh, excuse me, 100 plus locations, 50 this year. Um, and we have seen for things like crops like sweet corn, food production increases of 34% per acre. Per acre. So a tremendous change. And this affects 68 species of insects, and it will affect numerous crop types. We're talking about about 100 plus crops. Grapes, corn, wheat, soy. It's so inexpensive. For the first time, we'll be able to use a natural insect control technology for insects and row crops. Every major ag chemical company on the planet is surrounding this business. Mm -hmm. Its profits are going to be out of sight, even at these low costs, because everybody's going to want to use it. Entire governments will want to use this and standardize on this in their countries. Imagine, it's just a scent. So there's no insecticide affecting you, a consumer, and there's no insecticide affecting the farm worker who's picking those crops. Very exciting, and we're thrilled that it was our very first investment. Robotics. This is something a lot of people come to me about. And they're worried. People are worried, right? That example I gave you, that heart valve, a million square feet of space will be eliminated. About 10,000 workers who are hand-stitching heart valves, killing hundreds of cows. They kill 100 cows for a single heart valve. 100 cows, 100 sheep, or pigs, excuse me, these pigs and, and cows. So, yeah, you're right. And what are, how are we doing this? We're using robotics. We're using robotics to be the manufacturing technique. But where there's a big shift, there's often big opportunities. And this is why the most important attribute, I believe, for all of you, is your imagination. What ideas do you have to take these technologies and use them in ways that can improve the quality of life? So, you know, the traditional robot that we're familiar with looks something like this, right? So you're now getting transportation robots. We're seeing more sophisticated capabilities like playing ping pong. You're able to assemble models, box things, tape things. This is coming. One of our uh, portfolio companies is in metal. And it's going to be an incredible exit for us. We invested three and a half million dollars and the company was just appraised at a billion dollars and we have 65% of that company. Pretty good investment. Mm -hmm. But what's more important is what that technology is about to do. It's a metal that reduces friction by 75%. Not only does it reduce friction by 75%, but it's a titanium alloy so it doesn't rust or corrode. Not only that, but it, you can put it, apply it in micron thick layers. So it's extremely inexpensive. So you're talking about a manufacturing shift that's about to occur. It's a complete new paradigm for metal manufacturing. It's so important that some of our LPs, like Mike Milken, have offered to fund us to make sure that company stays here in the United States. We've had German and Japanese and Chinese companies approach us, but we're going to keep it here. Why? Because we're going to combine robots with this ability to have metals and coat things like aluminum with titanium, which has never been done before because this is a new titanium alloy. And so you can take a very inexpensive and complex part out of aluminum, which is a very soft metal, and make it as strong as titanium. So we're taking this technology and we're going to bring thousands of jobs to the United States because instead of a factory that needed lots of low-cost labor, you can combine it with robots and bring that home. Make the United States the leader in metallurgy and building metallic parts. What that then leads to is, as you're seeing, robots. We can design robots that don't wear out. Robots that last three or four times longer. We can design hips. If you get a hip replacement, 
Most of you young kids don't have to worry about this. <laughs> Some of us older people do, are thinking about this. Right? Imagine a hip that lasts 45 years instead of 15. So all of these opportunities are significant. And when you take this and the new forging technologies, you're now in a position where you're building something that can really do some amazing things. We're talking about improvements to vision. So we need to be able to build cameras that have not only recognition, but also can understand what it is that they see in all sorts of conditions. You need to be able to understand how we speak and what sort of tone we're using. Am I angry or am I happy? We need to understand that and interpret that. This is all done by software and hardware now. We need to be able to sense smell. For us to build true artificial intelligence, it's not just the brain. It's what the brain does simultaneously that's mind-boggling to me. Think about that, right? Think about what we're doing. You're load balancing and doing probability analysis and weighting to your smell, to your hearing, to your eyes, to the voice, to the sound, to the words, to the touch, all at the same time. The computational elements of these types of capabilities are spectacular. You have to do all of this at once. How can you do all of this at once without having a lot of amazing science? And so building that energy, joints, metal, movement, And ultimately, of course, an autonomous capability where the intelligence is such that you can weight all of these and know what's important. Mm, I smell good food. It must be time to eat. And ultimately, what do you get? A dancing robot. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more capability than that. So I think, I hope, tonight you saw a little bit about, first of all, what I think is important, which is that individuals with their imaginations, with their understanding of science, with the understanding of business, sales, and marketing, with the understanding of how technologies are today, but have the imagination to think about where technologies will be tomorrow. These combinations are going to provide us with some spectacular inventions. We're talking about reducing the cost of food, reducing the cost of energy, reducing the cost of health care, providing new technologies that reduce many of the mundane or dangerous tasks in mankind. It's going to be an interesting world. And I think the next 30 years will be more interesting than the last 30 because our understanding of nanoparticles and nanotechnology and all of these systems are coming into being as you are going through your education. Sure, I did some wonderful things, but I think what you can do will be much more wonderful. Thank you very much for having me.